Hey, we got a beautiful day out here at the Turner Valley Gas Plant. Uh, we have state students. Uh, the first and second years are involved in uh, a variety of surveys. The uh, second years are busy flying some drones. Uh, they're also doing some laser scanning in some of the buildings here on site. And then we have the first year state students. They're running around with some uh, GNSS RTK poles and tying in uh, some topography and some planimetric features, uh, buildings and fences and whatever you might see in the background. So a great day, sun's out, beautiful. Can't, can't beat it, getting off campus and uh, having a bit of fun here on site. Hello, my name's Rick Dukesher. I'm a faculty member for the Geomatics Engineering Program at SAIT. Uh, we're out at the Turner Valley Gas Plant. Uh, it's a historical uh, designated site and um, our hosts have invited us onto the premises to do some uh, different surveying methods. We've got uh, a number of different initiatives going on out here today. We've got uh, drone surveys, uh, terrestrial ground surveys and some 3D uh, scanning surveys going on. So. Uh, I'm running most of the drone surveys uh, and that involves doing a numerous flights with uh, different vertical and oblique photography to try and provide our uh, hosts with some 3D models of the buildings out here and also some engineering grade orthomosaic maps uh, as well as a, a digital elevation model of the uh, ground which will help them in their uh, historical archiving and uh, we've been trying to come out here every couple of years to help them uh, uh, monitor the site and uh, build them their data sets that they will use for future planning uh, and whatever other uses they deem necessary. We had one group of students that were uh, scanning some of the facilities inside and outside uh, uh, interior exterior some of these older buildings. Um, we had another group of students that were surveying all the ground control as those students were doing that and then we had a third group of students that were helping me with the drone surveys um, and this was all going on simultaneously uh, to provide uh, both the first and second year students with an idea as far as what uh, these types of uh, projects entail and all of the planning uh, and preparation that goes along with it. So after uh, we get back to the campus we will uh, collect all of our data and then begin the processing part in their, in their various classes. And then uh, by the end of the month, we should have a nice set of uh, orthomosaic maps and 3D models for our hosts to provide uh, the U of C archives with uh, when we're finished. Thank you. So these places, it's very important for the, gas, the oil and gas industry because it's considered the birth of the gas industry in Alberta. And it's the first one that, uh, to produce gas commercially. So that's why it's very important. It was discovered uh, in 1912 uh, because there is a natural seep around the area. And a guy called uh, Heron came and they took some samples and discovered that it was it was naphtha, almost like uh, almost gasoline coming naturally from the ground. So that's why they they decided to develop the site. The buildings were the the first buildings were all wooden buildings, 
and after a fire in 1920, they, did, they, they learned the lesson, so that, that's why another part of the, the importance of this place is how the layout of the buildings marks the, the, was the development of the, of, the, of the future sites, like spaced out and with the materials concrete and steel structures instead of wooden structures. Um, and all the buildings were, now the ones we have, they used to have a different use and they change uses around the time and the site doesn't look the same way it was before because industries like that, you, you build something then becomes obsolete and then a new technology came and replaced the other one. So, but in this particular site, site, you can see technology from the early 1930s to the last part of the 1980s. So it's, it's a big, huge uh, area that, that really marks if you are into the industry and, and, and you want to learn about the gas uh, production, uh, you, you can see how it started and, and, and the development of technology in different parts of the buildings and how, uh, and it was the commission in 1985. Like I said, uh Earlier, I think most of you heard me talking, but usually I would have the flight mission planned out before we get out to the site. I was out here a couple of weeks ago just to do a site assessment, uh, but um, before I came out here, I had the flight mission already mapped out, and I always do that for a couple of reasons. Number one is if you have the flight mission planned before you get out to the site, uh, you're aware of things like timelines and scheduling as far as how long the drone's going to be in the air. The other most important thing too is that uh, you know how much batteries you're going to need for, the, for that mission. So a lot of times you know you might end up at a site that you've never been to and you realize you don't have the battery capacity to cover the entire area. So by doing some pre-planning, which I always do for every single flight, uh, really helps you with some foresight before you get on to the site, there's no surprises. And also by doing the uh, preliminary site assessment, uh, you're, you can be aware of a lot of the obstacles, especially in a site like this that is extremely busy. We've got a lot of protruding structures that are quite high. Uh, and what we did in the morning, we took out the Mini, and uh, which is our micro drone, and we usually use that drone for a lot of reconnaissance work. So we flew that drone up and, and did a check of how high some of these structures were, like those uh, stacks and, and things like that. So that way when we plan the mission, we want to make sure that we plan it so you know we're flying well above any of these, these structures that could be an issue for us, okay? Um, so right now, uh, we've got about a 25 minute flight planned, which means we're probably not gonna make it on one battery, the drone that we're going to use for this mission is different than the one we were using this afternoon. It's the older model, but uh, just as capable. And, and in my opinion, you know, I, I kind of like this drone even a little bit better because this drone has some, some nice advantages to it in that uh, it does fly in quite cold weather. So this is an industrial grade drone. It flies up to minus 20. But uh, which means that temperature is not an issue for us. And the reason why it's capable of flying in, in those conditions is that because there's a, a, a battery heater inside the drone. So it keeps the batteries warm as it's flying. And it's kind of, uh, you know, you, you're probably thinking, well, doesn't it take battery power to charge up the battery heaters to keep the batteries warm? Yes, it does, but you know, they must figure that it, it's saving some battery time. So. You know, batteries are usually our biggest issue that we're always working against. So anytime we're working with payloads and, and uh, uh, large, large missions, we have to be careful and make sure we got enough juice to get us through. So this drone's kind of unique in that uh, we've got uh, two gimbals here. So I can slap on another camera at the same time and collect two sets of data if I wanted. So 
It's, you'll notice here it's got an FPV camera, so this one's hard mounted on the drone. This always gives me a visual as far as what's coming in front of me. This drone will be taking the pictures, or this camera will be taking the pictures as it's flying through the flight. So we're going to be doing vertical photographs, so when it gets in the air, that camera's going to tilt downwards at 90 degrees and start taking shots. So I had to do some uh, planning here. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw me doing this, but uh, I already had the mission planned out, but you know, this is not uncommon. You get out to the site and uh, just like today, the, the client uh, wants a different area scanned. So uh, we had to kind of remap the, uh, the area of where our flight mission is going to occur, which doesn't take too long, uh, so, but uh, it does kind of hold things up. So what we'll do is we'll take the drone and we're going to put it on a spot somewhere flat. We can launch off here. You know, it's, it's not the best. I usually like to have a landing pad because when these things start spinning, they're blowing air down and that's what propels the drone up. So uh, I like to get up in the air quickly for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is that the, the longer I'm, I'm hovering low, because a lot of people when they're flying, you know, they want to take it nice and slow and they like are, are real easy. But um, So if you guys see the, the plane there, you know, it's not terribly high. It's, you know, if, if we had this drone up in the air right now and that flew through our airspace, I would be very concerned. Uh, but the, the important thing is not to panic. And that's why you always have a visual observer with you. So like all of a sudden, bang, that plane was on us, right? We weren't, at least I wasn't aware of it until last minute. So if you always have a visual observer with you, which you absolutely should have at all times, the pilot's going to be monitoring the control uh, gauges and, and what the information is telling me there. The visual observer's job is to keep eyes on the drone at all times for things like that. Because it's, it's you know, not uncommon for you know, birds to come through your airspace and, and other aircraft. And, in Black Diamond, just down the road here, there's a aerodrome, so there's a lot of air traffic coming in and out of there. So that's why we'll see it busy, but uh, make sure that, you know, while the drone's up in the air, it's about a 25 minute flight, that everybody, you know, at least some people have their eyes on the drone, and if you see anything, you know, we like to keep our eyes on the, on the drone, but, you know, every once in a while, just do a scan every few seconds to make sure nothing else is coming through. And if something does, alert you to you know uh, a potential hazard you're gonna let the pilot uh, know it right away okay so in areas like this it's kind of important so we've got the drone fired up we've got a connection with the controller now so I'm just gonna move it to our, our launch spot and uh, And I always do a double check of all my, my uh, to make sure my props are on tight, to make sure my gimbal's on tight. Uh, these are the, these are the uh, GPS antennas there. So I wanna make sure that everything's secure uh, before I take off. Okay, I think we're good there. Uh, so what happens when you move the drone, uh, it's gonna have a, uh, a position assigned to where it's set up at, okay? So it knows where it's gonna launch and where it's gonna land from. So Lance has uh, assigned, set up our, our base. So the first flight we did this morning, um, everybody, we didn't have the RTK set up. Well, we had it set up, but we were getting too much interference from all the uh, busyness going on around here. So we moved the base out there. It looks like we've got a good connection now. So uh, Lance has a uh, surveyed out a, a coordinate, a set of coordinates at that location. And just like a, you know, a conventional RTK survey, I'm gonna input that uh, position into the controller, which will transfer the coordinates to the drone. So just like a typical RTK survey, I should be getting real-time corrections in the air as it's flying. And what's nice about that is that uh, 
you know, as the drone's flying and snapping those pictures, it's going to be assigning a coordinate and, uh, and burning a, a coordinate into each and every photograph. Those positions will be the corrected uh, positions coming from the RTK signal. So there's, by using the RTK method, uh, if you got the right conditions, you can really save a lot of time for the processing because I don't need to worry about ground control points or anything else, it's much faster. So folks, what happens is that, uh, you know, when you're working with RTK, there's a lot of things that uh, can, can sometimes impede the mission. So we had the base set up, everything was connected to the drone nicely, the drone was ready to go. Uh, but then when we input the actual coordinates for that point that it's sitting on, the data has to, it's essentially like picking up the, the tripod and moving it to a different spot. Because the data has to reacquire lock and re data has to reconverge on that point before we can lift off. So it takes usually a few minutes uh, before we can do that. There we go. That's a little better. Okay, so you guys are going to keep uh, your eye on the drone. I'm going to be watching my, my systems here. And uh, we've got about a 26 minute uh, flight. So we're at about 80 meters now, and here we're about 90. So now we're at our flight height. Now it's going to move into the flight mission. So it's going to go to the corner and it's going to start uh, zigzagging back and forth, and it'll move uh, laterally along this uh, edge here. Size is about the same size. I think it's a one inch uh, uh, CMOS, but the uh, the pixel size is much smaller than on the Phantom. So we can get a lot of good uh, ground resolution from from there. So. So we're coming up to the end of our first flight line. Uh, and it looks like we've still got about 84% of our battery left. So like I say, I don't think we're gonna make it through on one full set of batteries, but uh, it'll be close. Uh, we most likely have to bring it down and swap and then back up again. After, you know, after a few charges, you know, a hundred or a few hundred charges, they're going to start to degrade drastically. So I want to make sure that, you know, they all die a death together, I guess is the deal. Because if I'm, if I'm mixing and, because the drone will not go in the air if I have like a good capacity with this battery and this one's been used a million times and the capacity is much less, the drone, drone won't take off. So I basically can't use either battery. So if I'm mixing and matching all the time, I could end up with six batteries that are useless to me. So that's why I always keep them paired up together. 